To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon. If you understood what is given in section 28, section 28 does not talk about in which year to tax. It only talks about what are those incomes to be taxed or what are those incomes to be included under the head PGPP. What are those revenues to be included under the head PGPP. Section 28 is the primary charging section. Oh, are you saying there is more than one charging section? Yes. There is another section which I will come across later on and that is section 41 and I like to call it as the deeming section or the deeming section for charging or secondary charging section. What does section 41 say? We will see later on. But right now you remember that there are two sections in PGBP which will help us determine what is the income to be included. One is section 28 and the other is section 41. We will come across many others also but primarily these two are the ones that you must remember. Now a lot of you will find PGBP a little lengthy at the same time we will find it little complicated as compared to the other heads. This is primarily because you might lose focus on what we are studying on a daily basis and that is why to help you understand the provisions of PGBP easily and effectively. Let me divide all the provisions under the head PGBP into few blocks. Okay. And if you understand this bifurcation, then no matter where I start off from, no matter what provision we are doing, at least your mind will be able to sense that Ocha, we are studying this provision. Otherwise what happens is because it, there are many sections, there are many subsections, there are many clauses, you might get wavery. Okay. So let us see how PGBP is actually divided. Now, when you talk about profit, think when you are in school, your teacher would have taught you, profit is nothing but selling price minus cost price. Correct? Simple and straightforward. Must be when you went to college and you started learning a little accountancy and then you learned that there are there is mercantile piece of accounting, there is cash piece of accounting. Then you learnt a concept called as revenue minus expenses, correct? You made profit and loss account or you might have come across the term receipts versus payments, correct? Or Income versus expenditure. This is all the nomenclature that you would have come across for the same thing what we call as profit. So, in your school also profit, in college also profit. But now let me take you to a little advanced level, correct? Because now you are stepping into income under the head profits and gains from business or profession. So, how is this profit computed? How is this gains computed? For that, I need you to understand that computation of profits and gains from business or profession also has a similar thing. Only thing here, instead of revenue, we are going to consider all the income includable under this head as given by section 28, section 41. That is what I told you, the charging section. What does the charging section say? Charging section says these are the incomes that have to be included under the head PGPP. Of course, we are also going to learn what are the deductions which are available to us against the income that is chargeable under section 28 to section and section 
41. Achha, this term deductions, this is the first time you are hearing this. It's something like expenditure. One thing I can tell you, all the expenditure incurred and accounted will not be allowed as a deduction. All the expenditure which is incurred and accounted will not be allowed as a deduction. Achha, that means are you saying there are certain specific rules? for an expenditure to be allowed as a deduction, yes. I can also say all the expenditure which has not been accounted may also be allowed as a deduction. Meaning to say sometimes in the Income Tax Act, you might get more deduction than what you actually incurred. There are some places where you incur 100 rupees, they will give you deduction of 200 rupees. They will give you deduction of 150 rupees. Wow, kya baat hai? Yes, it happens, don't worry. That means from now on, when you come to income tax, when you come to computation of PGPP, you are not going to use the term expenditure. You are going to use the word deductions. You are going to use the term, is the expenditure deductible? Achha, where are you going to learn all these deductions? You are going to learn all these deductions ranging from section 30 to section 38, I would say. Section 30 to section 38. Of course, 37 is the last general deduction what we call. 38 is a small condition, but that, that's okay. So, we are going to learn which expenditure is deductible in these sections. What? Section 30 to section 38. Now, like I told you, every expenditure which has been incurred and accounted for may not be allowed as a deduction. Correct? These are called disallowances for the purpose of PGBP. Achha, new term we learned. What is the new term? Disallowances. So, what do we do with disallowances? When you disallow a certain expenditure, what happens to your profit? When you disallow, think and answer. If you disallow an expenditure, what happens to profit? Profit increases. Similarly, if certain conditions are not satisfied, in certain scenarios and circumstances, sometimes certain expenditure which has been incurred by the SSC, must be which has been accounted for also, it will not be allowed as a deduction because it is disallowed and such disallowances, what should we do? You will add. Let me give you a few examples so that your mind doesn't keep wavering around. Think about it. Let us say in my business, I appoint my own sister. Correct? And just because I want to claim something as salaries as an expenditure, I pay my sister 1 lakh rupees per month. And I claim it as an expenditure in my books of accounts. Correct? Acha. Don't you think this is unfair? Don't you think by doing such an act, I am actually reducing my profits and therefore I will be paying lesser tax? So some of you might say, so what? You might be paying lesser tax in your accounts, in your return, but your sister is paying tax. To Remember, my sister is an individual, individual has slab rates, slab rates will give you the benefit of lower tax rates. Meaning to say, when I am claiming a deduction, of salary, I am saving 30%. Whereas my sister, in that 10 lakhs or 12 lakhs, whatever, 1 lakh per month, she will not pay 30% on first 2.5 lakhs. Are you understanding what I am saying? There will be different slabs, therefore I am taking certain benefit. Do you think the income tax department will allow this to happen? The provisions of section 40A. I will come to the sections later on, don't worry. Say such kind of expenditure should be disallowed. Oh, fair enough. Do you find it fair enough? Yes. Similarly, similarly, sometimes what happens? SSEs might claim certain expenditure that they have incurred in cash in a mode other than by way of check, bank draft. And there is no way for the department to verify the genuineness of such a transaction. Let us say that there is a company which is earning a good amount of profit and they want to 
create certain expenses. They want to do window dressing, which is illegal, which is not tax planning, which is tax avoidance strategy. So what the company does, they claim on stupid expenditure. They say staff welfare, 5 lakhs. Paid in cash because they really did not pay. Correct. They will say business promotion, 10 lakhs. Paid in cash. Oh, ho. that means if you allow people to do window dressing of their accounts by allowing cash expenditure, by allowing expenditure in a mode other than by way of account pay check, account pay bank draft or through our electronic clearance systems, don't you think it is uh, unjust or unfair for the department because they will not be able to verify the genuineness? Therefore, such expenditure, such expenditure is disallowed if it has been incurred in a mode other than by way of account paycheck, account pay bank draft, correct? There are certain ECS, what not. Of course, to a certain small amount, they are allowed 10,000 rupees, which I will come to the benchmark later on. Is it fair enough? This you will learn in section 40A3. Similarly, sometimes certain payments, certain payments are to be made by the SSE wherein TDS is to be deducted. What is TDS? Primarily TDS stands for tax deduction at source. Let us say I am your client. Let us say I am your client. That means you have billed me 1 lakh rupees. Uh, there is a section which I will come across later on called section 194J. Which means if you are taking professional services from me, if I am providing professional services to you, correct, then you, when you are paying me, you have to deduct 10% as TDS. Matlab, although I have billed you 1 lakh, you should not pay me 1 lakh. You should pay me only 1 lakh minus 10,000 which is 90,000. This is the law. Achha, what do you do with the 10,000? You have to give it straight to the government as if it is my tax. We'll come to the concept later on. It's called TDS. Suppose you have not done this. What did the government say? The government said, Beta, when you are paying your uh, child accountant or your uh, consultant, you deduct 10% from his fees and pay it directly to us as if it is his tax. So that it becomes easier for the government also to collect taxes from people like me. See, today I don't have a problem of taxes. Why? Because every client who pays me, every client who pays me, is deducting 10% TDS only to pay me. So if I build 1 lakh, I'm getting 90,000. If I build 10 lakhs, I'm getting 9 lakhs. Oh, every time I get any money, including for teaching, every time I get any money from, let us say, an institution like Indigo Learn, they will deduct 10%. So it's, it's good for the government because they're able to collect tax at source. It's actually good for me also because knowingly or unknowingly, from every piece of cake that I receive, a certain amount is being removed. So, from every client, chota, chota, chota. So, I don't feel the burden really. Anyways, this is the law. Now, if you don't deduct, there is a provision which says, such kind of payment that has been made, the expenditure will be disallowed. Oh, oh. these we are going to learn. Achha. Also, there are certain, there are certain expenses where the SSE claims on mercantile base of accounting but might not end up paying. For example, SEC might say bonus accrued to be payable to the employees. Kya baat hai? Think about it. Think about it. On one side, bonus can be taken as a deduction on mercantile basis whereas if you remember I taught you in section 15, bonus is taxable in the hands of the employee only when it is received. Matlab, if company passes one journal entry saying bonus is payable 10 lakhs but doesn't pay the 10 lakhs to employee, that means company is taking deduction. At the same time, employee is not taxing it. Why? Because it's not yet received by him. Don't you think there's a gap? So what the loss is? The loss is in certain kind of payments, in certain kind of payments which we will learn under section 43b. The expenditure will be allowed as a deduction only if it has been paid either during the year or on or before the due date. We will come to the due dates later on. But what I am trying to tell you is that there are certain disallowances. These disallowances primarily are given in section 40, section 40A, section 43B. We will learn this. And then 
whatever we get this i call it as profits and gains from business and profession now if you look at this part this is very critical what is income under 28 and 41 see sometimes sometimes they might give you in the question they might give you in the question this is the profit and loss account of the ssc please ascertain what is profits and gains from business or profession as per the provisions of the income tax act 1961 acha now you know very well when you are looking into a profit and loss account on the credit side you will see all the so called revenues on the debit side you will see all the expenditures now looking into the credit side first how will you identify whether it is an income to be included under pgpp or not because we know section 28 it's a very easy task meaning to say there could be certain incomes which are not to be included under the head pgpp also let me take a very simple example okay listen to me carefully so let us say that there is a profit and loss account that has been given to us just for understanding on the credit side what do you have you have your incomes or you may call it as revenues on your debit side what do you have you have your expenditure or you may call it as expenses let us say the ssc one mr varun let's say myself think about it mr varun i have incomes from various sources i told you of course by profession i am a chartered accountant so there is certain fee from clients that i receive my passion is to teach and remember i take both face to face classes as well as online classes so i am getting certain amount of fees for teaching fortunately i have been able to save up little money and invest into purchase of a few houses and flats from where i get rent so i also get certain rental income correct and i always believe one must invest into the stock market small exposure in life why see sometimes there are certain companies where you know it's going to do good so i also feel a few companies i don't want to share any details right now but i feel a few companies are going to do very well in the future so these companies also pay me certain dividends let's suppose so i have certain dividend income now these are all my incomes 1 2 3 4 and on the expenditure side i have lot of expenditure right from uh, let's say uh, the expenses incurred for the employees that is salaries that i pay that is rent that i pay that is uh, let us say certain repairs and maintenance for the rental portion oh what not okay let us say there are some collection charges now listen to me carefully first of all first of all what are the incomes to be included you must identify first of all what are the incomes to be included fee from clients is my business or profession yes fee from teaching business or profession yes rental income no dividend income no once you identified this you know what has to be included into the computation can i say can i say income under section 28 and 24 should not include incomes not to be considered under pgbp for example rental income what should i do i should simply take the rental income excluded from the computation anyways let me now rephrase this whole computation into a very simple format for you correct and i will call it by two methods one is called as the direct method one is called as the indirect method overall what did you understand you understood that first we should take whatever is the income to be included under 28 41 correct minus whatever are the deductions that are allowable from section 30 to section 38 
and from those deductions you have to exclude or to the income you could add the disallowances that are generally given by section 40, 40A, 43. This is not the entire PGBP but this is the overall structure of PGBP. Let's understand how to do the computation in the exam. So let me bifurcate it into two ways. See, you understood the concept now. This is only the methodology of computation.